let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. One constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has ruled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, it's a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good. And it could be again. Oh, people will come, Ray. People will most definitely come. My guest today is William Steele. He is a professor of English at Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. He edits Nine, a journal of baseball history and culture, published by the University of Nebraska Press, and co-directs the annual Nine Spring Training Conference hosted in Tempe, Arizona every March. Steele is a prolific writer and presenter on various aspects of baseball and American literature, music, and history. Both his master's thesis and doctoral dissertation address W.P. Kinsella's baseball fiction. It was after reading Steele's first book, A Member of the Local Nine, Baseball and Identity in the Fiction of W.P. Kinsella, that Kinsella himself approached Steele about writing his biography. That request led to over five years of intense research and writing before Going the Distance, The Life and Works of W.P. Kinsella was published in 2018. And that will be our topic of discussion today. Of Going the Distance, Tim Wiles, former director of research at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum says, until now, W.P. Kinsella's life story has seemed as mysterious as that voice wafting over an Iowa cornfield. The man who wrote so much magic baseball fiction has himself remained a mystery. William Steele's biography of Kinsella truly goes the distance in carefully detailing the interesting life of a baseball writing genius. And I am happy to say that William Steele is with us today. Welcome, Professor Steele. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. First thing, I always like to ask about the cover of books. And on your cover is an interesting picture of W.P. Kinsella. And he's an interesting character fascinating, really, and we'll get into that. But where's that picture from? Yeah, uh, th- that was a picture that was actually from, it was taken by and, and part of the private collection of a guy named Lee Harwood, who was Kinsella's best friend for 40 or more years. The family and, and Lee had given me access to a lot of pictures and, and some things that had never been published before. And um, I really like that picture because, as you pointed out, it, it captures kind of the flamboyance of, of who Bill was. And so when I asked for, for different pictures, Lee sent me that one, and I just I, I knew that that was one that I wanted. Thankfully, you know, publishers don't always agree with, with authors on, on what the cover should look like. But they, they thought the same thing. They saw that picture and said, yeah, this is the one that we want. And so uh, I'm grateful for, for Lee for letting me borrow that one. William, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, since Iowa was the setting for much of W.P. Kinsella's work, we have Slingshot Dunkel Dark Lager from the Back Pocket Brewing Company located in the Iowa River Landing in picturesque Coralville, Iowa. Now, you might be thinking, what the heck is a Dunkel? I know, listening to History of Go-Go, you've heard Pilsner and Bach, Stout, and even Hefeweizen. But what is a Dunkel? Well, the simplest definition is Dunkel is a German term for dark, specifically referring to dark lagers from Bavaria in southern Germany. Now, several dark lagers are referred to as Bach, though. The difference is a Bach is much more complex. It's got higher alcohol content, it's fuller bodied, 
and much more malty. Dunkels, by comparison, are not intended to impress with their complexity, but instead are styled to be very easy to drink, so you can enjoy a Dunkel all night long and not just a single pint. And Slingshot Dunkel is designed for just that. I would also like to remind you to subscribe to the podcast. Simply click on the subscribe button on the directory that you use and get new material immediately after it is published. Subscribing is the only way to get new shows right away. And to the ever-expanding list of supporters and listeners from 50 countries and hundreds of cities across America, I would like to say thank you. And now I hold my slingshot dunkel from back pocket very high. And to the magical writing of W.P. Kinsella, I say cheers. Now, of course, we're going to get into the life and works of W.P. Kinsella. But before we do that, I'm wondering how you initially got interested in Kinsella. Are you just a fan of the literature? Yeah, boy, how long do you have? <laughs> I, you know, I started, uh, and, I, and I tell people this story, it really started even before I knew it started. And, and what I mean, uh, summer of 1989. There was a group of us that we were going out to see a, a movie, and uh, everybody else wanted to go see the, the latest Indiana Jones installment. And I wanted to go see this movie about some guy who hears voices and plows under his corn and builds a baseball field. And so I went to the theater by myself and watched it and, and fell in love with the story. And then when I found out that it was, you know, there was a novel, I tracked it down and read it and fell in love with it and thought that, you know, well, that's the end of it. And then when I was working on my master's degree uh, in English at Middle Tennessee State, I, as a dissertation topic, chose to look at the, the father-son relationships in the novel and in the film and how, you know, Phil Robinson in the film did this and, and W.P. Kinsella in the novel did this. And I thought I was finished with it. And then fast forward to my dissertation, and um, I, I decided to look at the ways in which Kinsella uses identity in his, in his novels, specifically his baseball novels. And I wrote that and thought, okay, I'm finished. And then my uh, dissertation committee said, you really should work on, on getting this published. And so a few years later, I kind of blew the dust off of it and, and cleaned it up a little bit and uh, submitted it for publication. And then I get this email from a guy in Canada who says, hey, I'm a, I'm a big Kinsella fan and you know, would like a copy of your book. And so we had corresponded for a little bit. What he didn't tell me was that he was friends with Kinsella. And uh, if you if you know anything about Kinsella, he is an atheist. He or was an atheist. He um, hates academia, and he despises literary critics. At the time, I was teaching at a at a Christian college. My degree is in literary criticism, and my entire professional career has been in college. You know, teaching college. And so I thought, well, this is three strikes, and I'm out. And Kinsella sends me an email and said, um, Hey, uh, you know, this guy was kind enough to loan me your book. And um, just wanted to let you know that you you did a pretty good job and you didn't screw up too badly on it. <laughs> In fact, my favorite line, and I asked him later if I could use this for another book on a, on a dust jacket. He said, you don't jump to absurd conclusions like so many academics tend to do. And I thought, you know what, coming from him, that's, that's pretty high praise. And so I responded and I thanked him. And then a couple of weeks later in uh, in the fall of 2012, he reached out to me and said, hey, I've got a idea to run past you, you know, feel free to, to tell me to, to take a flying leap, but somebody should write my biography. Other, He said, other writers with lesser reputations than my own have biographies done. And so I had no idea what I was doing. I said, sure, you know, I, yeah, how hard can it be? And then I spent the next four and a half years realizing exactly how hard it can be. <laughs> But it was, you know, it's been a, it's been a strange trip. Every, every time I think I'm finished with Kinsella's story, you know, something else would come up and, and keep it going. So it, it's been an enjoyable ride for sure. Well, let's start at the beginning, actually. Okay. Much of Kinsella's work is set in Iowa, but he's actually Canadian. Yeah. And I know he was born in 1935. That would have made him about 10 at the end of World War II. So being a young boy during the Great Depression, World War II, right. I wonder if that impacted him in any way. So what's the early years of Kinsella like? Well, the first 10 years of his life, he lived Basically, he was the only kid for miles around. His, um, you know, interestingly, the baseball tie-in started literally on the day he was born. Uh, the day he was born was the day that Babe Ruth hit the last three home runs of his major league career. Ruth was playing for the Boston Braves in Pittsburgh and hit the last three home runs. And a couple of thousand miles west in, uh, in Alberta, W.P. Kinsella is born. 
during the depression, you know, he lived on a, on a farm in a little town called Darwell. He said it was about 60 miles from, from Edmonton, but about, it may as well have been 600. And because he lived with his, his mom and his dad and, and for a while, an aunt of his, he was left to make up his own stories and develop his own games. And he lived, really lived inside his own imagination for about 10 years. You know, he put off going to school as long as possible, was homeschooled for, for several years. And then when it got to the point where his mother had kind of exhausted her ability to teach him, um, they moved on into Edmonton in, in 1945, at the end of the war, which is where, you know, he spent his adolescence and then his teenage years. But yeah, those early years, he said, I had to develop my own games. I created characters in my head. I would go out and, you know, play the roles of everybody in these stories. And so for him, he said that imagination really took hold those first 10 years of his life and just really that the power of that imagination never left him. He's a prolific writer. He doesn't publish anything, though, until he's in his 40s, I believe. Yeah. You know, what is the reason for dedicating his life to writing at that stage of his life? He's not a young man at that point. No. Well, he wanted he wanted to be a writer. And this is still sometimes the, the case where. You take these aptitude tests to kind of show you in, in middle school or high school, here are what your strengths are, here's what you might be suited for. And uh, Kinsella wanted to be a writer, always enjoyed his English classes, his writing classes, suffered through you know math and science courses and, and things. But um, in high school, he sat down with his counselor, and the counselor you know called him in, as they did with each student, and kind of talked about future plans. And Bill said, I, I want to be a writer. And, and the counselor said, well, that's, that's something you can do as a hobby, but you're not going to make a living at it. And years later, Kinsella went back. He said this in several interviews, but I found it interesting. He said this to a group of students at that high school. He said, there's a special place in hell for that counselor, because who is he to, to tell some teenage kid not to pursue what he wants to do? And so Kinsella, he wrote you know, wrote some letters to the editor, wrote some, you know, fictional pieces for a newspaper contest occasionally uh, in his in his teens and early 20s. But yeah, as you point out, he didn't really start writing until uh, his 40s. He worked a bunch of jobs that he hated, selling phone books, uh, selling insurance. He, he opened his own pizza place. And then he and his, his wife at the time, who was his second wife, they decided to sell the pizza business. They, they went to school, uh, went back to university. And then when he realized that he was good at writing and it was something he wanted to pursue, he finished his degree at University of Victoria and then uh, pursued a, an MFA at the University of Iowa, at the famous writer's workshop there. And, and it was at that point, as you said, in his, in his early 40s, where he finally you know, published for the first time. In, what, 1977, his first collection came out. Well, I love that. And, uh, where there's always talk about the book industry dying, and uh, I don't think it is at all. I think the uh, people, it's much more personal to have a book than to read it on an electronic device. Kinsella's work is almost exclusively fiction. Mm -hmm. It's normally broken into two main categories, First Nation, People of Canada, and baseball. Yep. If we take the Native American writings first, what are those pieces of literature known for? I know he was criticized for writing from the First Nation perspective at that time. Yeah, when they first came out, you know, he had he had been writing a lot of things at the University of Victoria and wasn't having any luck getting them published. And he, uh, there was a Canadian writer who is, is still alive, uh, W. D. Valdridson, and he came on after Kinsella graduated to teach at, at University of Victoria. Kinsella audited the class and, and because he wanted to study under Valgerson. And Valgerson gave him some important advice. He said, you're, you're spending two pages warming up, and then you're writing for two pages too long. And he, he brought out the scissors and kind of cut off the top couple of pages and the bottom couple of pages and said, try it this way. And from that point on, Kinsella sold just about every piece he, he wrote from that point on. One of the stories was one called Ileana Comes Home. And Kinsella said he wanted it to be kind of a, a bittersweet story of um, what he said it was going to be like, guess who's coming to dinner, except on a, on a Native American reservation. And so this Native American girl brings home a, a white guy from the town. And he, he meant it to be a serious commentary, but when he was reading it, he wrote it in the voice of this teenage kid living on the reservation. People were just laughing. They thought it was the funniest thing ever. 
And Kinsella said, you know, I didn't realize how funny it was until I went back and read it aloud. And so he captured that voice and started putting together all of these stories from that same kid's perspective, uh, Silas Erminskin. I actually wasn't trying to be funny when I wrote the story. I was trying to make a bittersweet comment about race relations. And uh, again, I had a vein of gold, so I wrote 118 stories. And put together a collection, Dance Me Outside, and you know they deal with serious topics alcoholism, drug use, poverty, rape, that happen on reservations. And what's interesting is the criticism that he got because of, you know, here's a, a middle, middle-aged white man writing in a Native American voice. That largely came from academics and literary critics. When Kinsella would show up and do readings for Native audiences, Early on, the, those audiences loved the story. They said, man, here's somebody who gets us. And then they were surprised when they showed up, and that guy was not one of them. He was this outsider. Uh, but they said, you know, you're able to capture our voice. The more successful they got, those stories got, the more vocal the critics became about uh, things like voice appropriation and whether or not somebody, um, like I said, like a, a, a white, middle-class, you know, middle-aged man could write from that perspective. And so... He had actually, Kinsella had actually planned on stopping writing those stories, particularly after the baseball stories took off and became so successful. But there were some critics in Canada, one specifically named Rudy Weeb, who uh, were so vocal that Kinsella, more out of spite than anything, just kept writing them. And it would infuriate his critics and make him incredibly happy when he was kind of able to get a dig in at them. But those stories are, you know, the first four books that he published were for those stories. And so he had this whole career before the baseball story. And, and I asked him one time, I said, you know, how are you going to be remembered as a writer? And it was interesting because he recognized he's going to have a group in Canada that remembers him for the Native stories, uh, the First Nation stories. And then the American audiences are going to remember him for the baseball stories, specifically Shoeless Joe, you know, that was turned into Field of Dreams. And so it's interesting that even as he was writing these things, uh, and, and later in his life, when he started publishing again, it's interesting that he recognized that, that he's going to be remembered in two very distinct ways. Well, he's got a fascinating background. He grows up in Canada. He goes to school in the United States. Yep. So he actually has experience in both countries. It must give him perspective when he writes in either location or about either location. Yeah, yeah. And, and when the you know, when he started to make a name for himself, when he had a, a more of an international uh, audience, he wanted to go back and change the locations of the native stories to the U.S. so that they would be, you know, more readily acceptable, accepted by uh, American audiences and the publisher wouldn't do it. And he was furious because he recognized the thing that was holding these stories back from becoming popular in the United States was the fact that they were set in Canada. You know, he fell in love with Iowa when he moved there in, in 76. And, you know, most of his baseball stories, um, with the exception of one or two that I can think of, are all set in Iowa. And, of course, all of the native stories are set in Canada because once he established that as the setting, you know, you can't just all of a sudden up and move them to, you know, South Dakota without some type of explanation. And so, yeah, he, you know, his experience in both call and, and his father was an American. And so his own family, he had an American father and a Canadian mother. And so, um, you know, there's kind of this sort of dual uh, aspect of his, his personality and of his writing that are, you know, some of it's Canadian, some of it's American. Americans, when they read something that they like, they say, by golly, I like that. Let's write to this fellow and tell him I liked it. Uh, Canadians, if they read something and they like it, they say, gee, I like that. There must be something wrong with it. Kinsella, of course, as we've mentioned, is best known, at least in the United States, for his writings about baseball. Mm -hmm. I know you like baseball as well. What can we learn about society, race, politics, or, and even religion through the study of baseball? Boy, you know, I, I teach a class where we look at all of those things through sports. It's a sport lit class, but I tend to lean more towards baseball because it's my primary area. Well, yesterday we, we celebrated Martin Luther King Day. And, you know, Dr. King said that Jackie Robinson is really the inspiration for him doing what, what he did, what Dr. King did. It's no coincidence that April of 1947 is when Major League Baseball was desegregated. You know, modern baseball was desegregated. 
Nelson with Jackie Robinson, and less than two years later, the the U.S. military, right? Harry Truman desegregates the military, and you know, blacks and whites serve together instead of these you know separate groups. And you know, you look at the civil rights movement, and and you know, twelve it took twelve years for the last team to have a black player on its roster, right? Boston and, and Pumpsy Green signed in the 1959. It's not until 12 years after that, in 1971, that the Pittsburgh Pirates field the first starting lineup that did not have a white player in it. And so, you know, when you look at the, the, the growth of the civil rights movement and, and, you know, issues of equality are oftentimes slow and happening, and that's mirrored in that you can look at baseball and, and see that. Um, you look at, uh, you know, Kurt Flood and the ways in which free agency impacted Major League Baseball, and you can look at it from, you know, business perspective. You can look at, you know, baseball as religion, where I remember going to Cooperstown to the Baseball Hall of Fame a few years ago, and Kurt Schilling's bloody sock from the playoffs in, what was it, 2004, was behind the case, and you would have thought it was like Christ's burial shroud. Right. It, I mean, people were there like this holy relic. You know, we talk about baseball having cathedrals, you know, these stadiums that are cathedral like. And so there's a lot of connection there. And I think that, you know, the idea you look at, uh, you know, Shoeless Joe Jackson and the, the story of the 1919 Chicago White Sox, that idea of people having so much faith in the national pastime that when something like the, the scandal in 1919 happens, it shakes their faith. And, and it is very much a, a type of religious faith. You know, that, that people have in these institutions. I believe in the Church of Baseball. I've tried all the major religions and most of the minor ones. I've worshipped Buddha, Allah, Brahma, Vishnu, Siva, trees, mushrooms, and Isidore Duncan. I know things. For instance, there are 108 beads in a Catholic rosary and there are 108 stitches in a baseball. When I learned that, I gave Jesus a chance. But it just didn't work out between us. The Lord laid too much guilt on me. I prefer metaphysics to theology. You see, there's no guilt in baseball, and it's never boring, <laughs> which makes it like sex. There's never been a ball player slept with me who didn't have the best year of his career. Making love is like hitting a baseball. You just got to relax and concentrate. Besides, I'd never sleep with a player hitting under 250. Well, unless he had a lot of RBIs, there was a great glove man up the middle. You see, there's a certain amount of life wisdom I give these boys. I can expand their minds. Sometimes when I've got a ball player alone, I'll just read Emily Dickinson or Walt Whitman to him. And the guys are so sweet, they always stay and listen. Of course, a guy will listen to anything if he thinks it's foreplay. I make them feel confident, and they make me feel safe and pretty. Of course, what I give them lasts a lifetime. What they give me lasts 142 games. Sometimes it seems like a bad trade. But bad trades are part of baseball. I mean, who can forget Frank Robinson for Milk Pappas, for God's sake? It's a long season, and you got to trust it. I've tried them all I really have. And the only church that truly feeds the soul day in, day out, is the Church of Baseball. I think that that's one of the things that Kinsella realized, was Americans have this fascination with this national pastime. And so, as he said, once I found that I had an audience that was ready to devour this type of story because of the baseball connections, he said, that was like tapping into a vein of gold in a mine. And you're going to keep digging and keep digging until you mine every little nugget out of that. And so that's, that's when he shifted from the, the native stories more towards the baseball stories. Now, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. Dr. Steele, I'd like to run a few quotes from W.P. Kinsella by you. And okay. you could put your professor hat on for a minute <laughs> <laughs> and analyze these for me. So okay. here's my first quote, and it's in reference to baseball. This is from Kinsella, quote, baseball is the most perfect of games, solid, true, pure, and precious as diamonds. If only life were so simple, within the baselines, anything can happen. Tides can reverse, oceans can open. That's why they say the game is never over until the last man is out. Colors can change, lives can alter. Anything is possible in this gentle, flawless, loving game, close quote. Kinsella almost sees a magical quality in baseball. 
Yeah, absolutely. He uses that same kind of sentiment in a lot of his in a lot of his books. You know, he's he was really drawn towards the genre of, of uh, magical realism, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, for instance. And and he likes this idea of blending, you know, fantasy and into reality and kind of this mystical sort of storytelling. You know, the great thing about baseball is, and, and that quote touches on this very thing, there's no limit to time. You know, he has a novel where a game goes on for 40 days and 40 nights, right? 2,000 plus innings. On a baseball field, the uh, foul lines diverge forever. Uh, so there's theoretically no distance that a great hitter couldn't hit the ball. So that makes for uh, larger-than-life characters and uh, makes for fantastical situations. Anything can happen. You know, if you stick around long enough, you know, somebody who, you know, Bucky Dent might be the game winner, hit the home run, right? And, or it might be, you know, some no-name, you know, kid called up and makes his first major league start and throws a no-hitter or, or something like that. There's always possibility. Football, we're limited to you know, 16 games and then the playoffs. You know, basketball, 80, what, 82 games. Hockey, same thing. Baseball goes on much longer, twice as long as any of those other sports. And it's not confined by time. It's not confined by space. And the fact that anything can happen is what keeps us coming back. There's a lot of dead time in baseball, but there's that one moment where you know, somebody steps up and hits the you know game-winning home run like Kirk Gibson, you know, off Dennis Eckersley in in '88, and and it's those iconic moments that we keep coming back to. And Kinsella tapped into that, I think, really better than any other baseball writer in, in the 20th century. I, I I would argue. Now, many would consider Kinsella's book "Shoeless Joe" as his masterpiece. It certainly is the best known, having been made into the film Field of Dreams starring Kevin Costner. Right. Tell us a little bit about Shoeless Joe, and are there any major differences between the novel and the movie? Yeah, boy, that's a great question. He, you know, he wrote the story. The first chapter is, a, is basically a short story that was written in uh, the late 70s when he was leaving Iowa to go teach at uh, the University of Calgary. He was leaving to teach creative writing. He had fallen in love with Iowa. He loved the landscape, the people just everything about it, but he was leaving because he needed this job. And so he wrote the story, Shoeless Joe Jackson comes to Iowa, and it goes up to the point where Shoeless Joe Jackson appears on, on the field. And that was included in a collection of short stories in 1979. And in Boston, there was a bookstore, and this guy who was an assistant to an editor at Houghton Mifflin was reading a two-sentence blurb about this short story. And he had never even read the short story, just this, this two-sentence blurb. And he writes a letter to Kinsella, right? This is pre-email. Writes him a letter and says, hey, you've probably already started a novel because this sounds like a fantastic story, but you should write a novel and I'd love to work with you on it. And Kinsella wrote him back and said, I've never written a novel, never published a novel, wouldn't know what I need to do, but if you work with me, we'll do it. And so you have this guy who's never published a novel with somebody who's never edited a book. And it worked. They de he developed this over the course of the next nine months or so. You know, in the novel, if, if you've seen the film, of course, you know, the Terrence Mann character uh, that, that James Earl Jones portrays. In the novel, he actually kidnaps J.D. Salinger. <laughs> when they were making the movie, Salinger, of course, was still alive and being known for never running away from a good lawsuit. Salinger's lawyers reached out and said, yeah, we're going to go ahead and sue you if you make that, you know, into a movie. And um, Kinsella was kind of angry at the producers for not fighting it and going. He thought it would be a great story. But so they changed it to the Terrence Mann character. There's an entire section about a player called Eddie Kid Sissons that is cut from the from the film, doesn't even appear. Ray Kinsella, Costner's character, has a twin brother in the novel who doesn't appear. But Phil Robinson, when he wrote the book or when he wrote the screenplay, kind of meshed the two twin brothers into one character. Mm. And, and so there are some significant differences. It, it's always interesting, you know, when somebody watches the, the movie and then goes and reads the book, you know, they're like, well, boy, the, the book got all this wrong. Like, well, no, the, bo the book was out a few years ahead, you know. So, <laughs> But when, the, when Phil Robinson did the screen, wrote the screenplay, he reached out to Kinsella and Kinsella said, look, this is your project. You do with it what you want. But when he read the, the first draft of the script, Stella was actually moved to tears and said, I, I couldn't have done a better job than this. 
And so he was happy with it, but he did recognize just due to time constraints that the entire novel, there was no way to fit that into a, in, into a film uh, without having, you know, be like gone with the wind, epic length type thing. So can can we do another quote from Kinsella? He's got some great quotes. Sure. This one's about success and happiness. Yeah. He says, success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you get. Yeah. Now, what in his life did he learn, his experiences maybe, that led him to make a statement like that? Yeah, and that's one every day you get on Twitter or on Facebook, and I promise you, if you type that quote, somebody is going to have quoted that at least once. That is his most famous quote. Out of, out of everything he wrote, you know, he spent 40 years doing things that he had to do. You know, he had two kids to support. He had, um, he'd gone through, he was on his fourth marriage at the time he died. Uh, but when, you know, his kids were young, he was working those dead end jobs, not because he wanted to, but because he had to provide for his family. And then once his kids were old enough and he was able to kind of shift gears and focus more on himself, he got to do those things that he had wanted to do all along. And so I think that that gave him an appreciation for what he was doing. You know, he said he had wasted so many years of his life not writing that he felt compelled to keep writing now that he had the opportunity. And so, you know, I think that the the idea at, at various points of his life, he would argue that, or he would say that he was neither happy nor successful. But then later on in his life, when his writing began to take off, I think he would absolutely say that he was both happy and successful for what he got and for wanting what he got. So Kinsella was an atheist, and he's incredibly tough on self-righteous people, it seems to me. Yeah, yeah. In his own words, I like using his words. He says, right. in terms of religion, the kind of people I absolutely cannot tolerate are those who never let you forget that they're religious. Yeah. Seems to me that a truly religious person would let his life be an example enough would not let the religion interfere with him being a human being and would not be so insecure as to have to fawn publicly before his gods. That's a pretty strong statement. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, at least one of the people that that was directed towards was his, was his mother-in-law, uh, his third wife, Anne Knight, who in a lot of ways is a lot like Annie Kinsella in the novel. Very religious parents, specifically the mother. Corrine English, and she and, and Bill Kinsella rarely saw eye to eye, except for when it came to caring for Anne, his wife, and she had some, some mental health issues, but he would, he would be infuriated with the self-righteousness uh, from his mother-in-law and, for, and from people like her that made sure that, that you knew that they were better than you because of their religion. And that was one of the things that was really just terribly off-putting for him. And so that, and that was one of the things, you know, when I, when I agreed to write this biography, you know, like I said, I, I have taught at faith-based institutions for my entire career. And, you know, I'm sitting across from him at his kitchen table wearing a shirt that says Oklahoma Christian University. And I was like, you know, boys, how's this going to end? And he recognized, look, people can believe what they want to believe, but don't make me feel lesser because I don't believe the way that you believe. And, uh, you know, if you read a lot of his books, there are a lot of uh, not so subtle digs at Christians who are hypocritical, who are self-righteous, who are, you know, really just kind of self-absorbed. And that's what really infuriated him. Now, he also doesn't have any lost love or respect for academia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think he likes the restraints on thought that often comes with academics. Right. Uh, he was a professor at one point in his past. Mm -hmm. So where does this criticism and mistrust of academia come from? A lot of it is, you know, what you said, the constraints of academia. You know, you're called to write a certain way, you know, cite this many sources, adhere to this format. And, and his thinking was what makes writers great are ones who are willing to go their own way and, and break the rules and, and not be confined by all of that. He taught for five years at Calgary. And I think one of the great, well, I, I know one of the great pleasures that he took was when he was offered tenure and he turned it down and said, I'm actually leaving academia at the end of this year. And they were shocked. You know, nobody, you, you work to get tenure so you can have that, you know, that, that uh, stability. And uh, at that point, she was, Joe had taken off and was making him enough money. And he said, look, I've got enough to live on for two or three years. I'm going to go all in and gamble on myself. And it worked out well for him. 
Um, but he would he would get so frustrated at um, you know, students that he said should the only reason they should be allowed on a college campus is if they're working in a cafeteria was one of his lines. He said one of the admissions requirements are you able to fog a mirror up when you breathe? You know, so he was really not not the 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 kindest professor. His criticism was oftentimes blunt and very brutal because you know he said that the problem is that students are being told what they want to hear so that they'll keep paying the tuition rather than what they need to hear, which is you're not a very good writer. So a lot of those types of frustrations and, and the endless committee meetings and, and teaching classes, you know, that he wasn't interested in just really was so much of a grind that at the end of that fifth year, he just walked away from it and, uh, and never looked back. He, he would show up occasionally to do these week-long summer sessions at the University of Iowa. But, uh, you know, as far as teaching a, a full load in an academic setting, he, he never did that again from 83 until the end of his life. I'm going to go back to another quote from Kinsella. And this one, I'm going to make a comparison to Bruce Springsteen. So be, bear with me for just a second there, Professor <laughs> okay. Steele. <laughs> okay. And this is the quote. Writers are magicians. They write down words as if they're good. You believe that what they write is real just as you believe a good magician has pulled coins out of your ear or made his assistant disappear. (laughs) It's disingenuous in a way. Now I want to make the tie to Bruce Springsteen because I'm actually a pretty big Bruce Springsteen fan. And one time I heard him in an interview talking about all this music he's written, oh, almost 400 published songs and many more that he's never published. And what he said was, I feel like it's a big lie. You know, people think that these are based on my experiences, and I just made it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kinsella called that the implied author syndrome. I actually talked about this this morning in a, in a World Lit class I'm teaching. You know, we hear songs that Springsteen sings, or, or we read stories from W.C. Kinsella or Ernest Hemingway or, you know, Mark Twain, whomever. And we think that, well, they must be writing about their own experiences. Right. We must be they must be writing some form of autobiography and Kinsella. And he said, you know, he had fallen victim to that, that that when he first met Bill Valgerson, the guy that I mentioned earlier, uh, under whom he had studied in at University of Victoria, he had expected this big, burly Viking like guy, because that's the type of things he read in, or he wrote about in the story. And uh, he said, you know, my job as a writer, you know, people want to read my fiction and think, you know, well, I have some sort of like, you know, father issues because of the the fathers in, in my stories are often missing or whatever. And he said, I'm writing fiction. And that's what good writers do is they make you believe that what they're writing is real or could be real. He said, you know, if you if you give me two pieces of flora, two pieces of fauna and a couple of street names, I can make you think I've been to any city in the world. And he would do that. He would pull up. Uh, uh, I was living in Oklahoma at the time. And I, I said, you know, Broken Bow, Oklahoma is in one of your stories. You know, have you been there? And he said, no, I, I saw it on a map and I, I <laughs> liked the name. And <laughs> Sounded great. Uh, yeah. yeah. I looked up some street name and it's like, well, wow. You know, and it's, it, but it's that if you throw in just enough detail to make it real, the, the reader will believe it. And he said, you know, the thing about Shoeless Joe is people like the idea of redemption and second chances because too often in life, we don't get those things. And so if I can give you that in this story, it gives you a chance to live what you want to happen rather than what actually does happen. And I think good songwriters, Bruce Springsteen certainly being among them, good writers, W.P. Kinsella included, they do that. They're able to make us believe. They are, they are magicians. They make us believe those things, those things, even if they're not true. I'd like to discuss one of Kinsella's works. Okay. And because it has... It just appeared to me that it has a local connection. And I sent you that story, but it's the Iowa Baseball Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to lay out this story for you, and then you can talk about the Iowa Iowa Baseball Confederacy and see if there's any connections. It's a little local connection to here in Quincy, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. So in September of 1907, a minor league team from Quincy played the Chicago Cubs. Now, this was an exhibition game. The team had played in the Iowa League. Which, when I heard that, I'm like, okay, there's an immediate connection to Kinsella there. Right. Their season was over, so they set up this exhibition. The Cubs were on their way to Cincinnati, I think, and so they were going to come to Quincy, and they played at what was then called uh, Quincy Sportsman's Park. 
the entire community shows up for this. River boats, you know, we're on the Mississippi. So river boats show up from Keokuk and Hannibal. They're bringing in spectators from all, all over. The railroad, the Wabash, even agrees to hold the train to make sure that Cubs got to the next game in Cincinnati. So nearly the whole town shuts down. The, the factories shut down. They let people leave early so they can go watch this game. And in the game, the Quincy minor leaguers struggle, as you might imagine, right off the bat. They're intimidated by the Cubs, and uh, the Cubs score two runs in the first inning. There's three errors. It's just kind of a comedy of errors. But in the bottom of the third, the Quincy team scores three runs. And you can kind of, I, I read the accounts of the game, and it's almost like the fans are starting to realize, just like what Kinsella was saying, that, you know what, what we didn't think could happen, the impossible just might happen. Well, the Quincy's pitcher was a guy called Walter Brother Rouse. They referred to him as Brother Rouse. And he was what would, we would refer to as a junk ball pitcher. And he was able to keep these major leaguers off balance, shut them down the rest of the game. The Quincy team wins 5-2. to two. This actually shocks the baseball world at the time. The Chicago Tribune says the Cubs, now they come out and they write the story, but they said the Cubs didn't play any of their starters, which was not true. There were a couple of people that were out because of injury, but aside from that, everyone had played in the game. I think they wrote that just to kind of limit the embarrassment to the major leaguers, and the Cubs went go on to win the 1907 World Series and the 1908 World Series. Now, I know this actual game that happened in Quincy didn't last for 2,000 innings, but do you think there could be any connection? Do you think Kinsella may have heard about this story, this actual story, and used it as a maybe as a kernel of an idea for the Iowa baseball confederacy. Yeah. And, you know, when you sent me that story, I was kicking myself like, how did I not find this out as I was doing research? Because Kinsella gave me access. He, he mailed me hundreds of pages of handwritten notes. He gave me, sent me home from his house with a box full of about 40 years worth of his his private diaries and, and daily calendars. I had access to all of his papers at the Canadian Archives, and I never came across this. But I do know, like with Shoeless Joe, the Moonlight Graham character that in the film is played by Burt Lancaster, he stumbled across that in a copy of the uh, baseball encyclopedia that his in-laws had given him for Christmas one year. And then he and his wife, Anne, had gone to the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum and had dug around the archives there and talked with the librarian and pulled as much information as they could get there, it absolutely would not surprise me. And I think it's, it's very likely that he stumbled across that story because of the just the similarities. And he was someone who, when he did uh, was in Iowa, um, would research quite a bit at the, at the uh, university library there in Iowa City. And he knew a pretty fair amount of Iowa history. He would incorporate very real people and events from Iowa's history into into his fiction, again, to make it believable. And so while I, I can't say for certain that he knew that story, I would absolutely, I'd feel comfortable betting money that, that he had come across it at some point in his reading. Well, another quote that he has, kind of tied to this story a little bit, and I love the fact, I, I wish he would have come up with that story with the Iowa Baseball Confederacy in the 2000 innings. I think it lasted 40 days, didn't yeah, it, that yeah. game? Yeah, and in the middle of a flood, yeah. <laughs> he, you know, for somebody, for somebody who wasn't religious, he had a very keen understanding of, of the Bible. He said, and I asked him one time, I said, you know, for somebody who's an atheist, you know the Bible better than some Christians I know. And he said, well, it's a great story. He goes, now, I don't think any of it's true. But it's a really good story, and so he would, you know, he would use things like the, you know, the flood and and you know Christ's resurrection and all of these things, and and a lot of times his his baseball stories do have that religious flair to them. Well, he said, if I have the choice between looking something up and making it up, I'll just make it up every single time. So <laughs> yeah. you know, to <laughs> which which by the way is really frustrating for a biographer. Because there were times when I would run across an interview where I found this piece of information that I had never, I was like, that's not, that can't be right. And I would ask him about it and he would say, yeah, I was seeing if the, if the interviewer was going to do his, his job and investigate this. And so I would just make stuff up. And then in, in his <laughs> daily, you know, I had mentioned he'd send me back with his, 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 he would have these desk calendars or like day planners. And he would kind of fill in, you know, on this day I did this interview or I wrote this many pages. And 
there was one entry where he was talking about being offered the position of director at the Iowa Writers Workshop in the 80s. And I thought, you've got to be like this. I never knew this. And so I'm really excited about it. And I called him up and, and I said, Bill, I just found this in your diary. I need to know more about you being offered this position. And he said, oh, that didn't happen. I said, no, 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 it did. I'm reading it. in your It's in your own handwriting, in your diary. And he said, what's the date? And it was April 1st. And I said, well, it's April 1st. And as soon as I said it, I'm like, oh, no. And he said, yeah, <laughs> check all of the April 1st uh, entries, and you probably shouldn't use anything from those in the biography, you know. <laughs> Golly. And so, yeah, he would make stuff up and, and would, and it was, you know, really frustrating for for a biographer to have to go back and verify all of this stuff. Cause he would send me on a lot of the, he didn't know it when he was writing it back in the 80s, but those diaries led to a lot of dead ends. But it also made for some pretty funny conversations with him. So, now he's an interesting person. Personally, mm-hmm. he seems cantankerous. He seems like one of those individuals that have a rough exterior, and then when you get on the inside, he's he can be warm and engaging. Yeah. How did you come to know him personally, and was it difficult for you to earn his trust? Well, it was interesting because, as I mentioned, you know, he reached out to me, and as somebody who was an academic, I thought this this can't end well. Um, but I was also curious enough to, to try it. And so the first time I met him, he had picked me up. I had flown in and uh, to Seattle and driven up into Canada. And he picked me up, and we went to a Tim Hortons and ate breakfast in the parking lot. And then we went up to his house and just, he would play, he was a, a he loved Scrabble, would play Scrabble all the time. He was actually a competitive Scrabble player. And I would, he would be on his iPad playing multiple games of Scrabble and I would be sitting there going through his notes and diaries and asking him questions. And then when I went home, I spent about three days with him. And then when I went home, we would talk sometimes multiple times a week. Sometimes we wouldn't talk for a couple of weeks and I would, you know, run into a brick wall and and have to kind of a dead end research wise and have to ask him a few things. He could be very abrasive. He could be really uh, kind of, like you said, cantankerous is putting it nicely. But then there were these moments where, you know, he would talk about when his, a couple of weeks after I had agreed to do the um, the biography, his fourth wife died. And reading some of his private notes and some of the, the comments he made in his diaries, just really beautiful. You know, he missed his wife. I think there were some some regrets, some things that, you know, he wished maybe could have been done a little bit differently. And so you got to see that softer side of him. The the week that he died, he was one of the first people to take advantage of the um, Bill C-14, which is a assisted suicide bill in Canada. And uh, he had uh, some really big health issues, and, and he was in a, an immense amount of pain. And he had his daughter email me and, and say, you know, hey, dad is, well, well, first of all, when he went into the hospital, he thought, well, I'm going to be in here for five or six weeks and then, you know, nature's going to do its thing and I'm going to leave here. And so he told me, if you have any other questions, ask them now, which is a weird position to be in. But the week that he died, his daughter emailed me on Monday and said, dad, we'll be leaving this earth on Friday. Wishes you all the best. Said it's been a pleasure working with you and hope the book does well, you know, and it's, you know, I thought it was a very nice, you know, just a few days before he was going to die you know, thanking me for the work that I had done and, and wishing me well. And so there was kind of this, you know, if you got on his wrong side, he would never forgive you. And he was very open about that. He said, I don't forgive. And so he would carry grudges from years ago. He, When his dad had stomach cancer, Bill was a senior in high school. About six weeks before he, his father died, his dad went back to the Catholic Church and Bill never forgave him. He said, I can't believe, he said, when it's my time to go, even if I'm wrong, I'm not going to be a coward and say I believe in something that I've denounced for so long. And so it, it wasn't just people in passing that he would have this attitude towards. It was his own family. But, you know, like I said, there were also these beautiful, I, there were a couple of letters. I, I didn't include them in the book because I felt as though they were between he and his daughters. Letters that he had written to Shannon and Aaron, his two daughters, that were just beautiful letters. And, and having two daughters myself, you know, I, I I appreciate the fact that he took the time to say, hey, I, I want you to know how much I love you, and, and here's why. And, and so it was nice to be able to see both sides of this guy. You know, I saw it a little bit because I knew a little bit from the research about his nature in that regard and mm-hmm. holding grudges. 
But then when I witnessed him on these videos, reading some of his work to his fans, he's so warm and engaging and funny. Yeah. And, and, you know, he would have fans who would show up unannounced and want to throw baseball with him or want to have him sign a book. And he was always so open and, and, and really warm uh, with his fans. So I think he appreciated that, you know, because he realized, look, without these people, I'm not, you know, I'm not putting food on my table. But he also appreciated the fact that there were readers who cared enough about what he did to reach out and, and let the author know. And it is always, it's nice to get an email or a letter or have somebody come up to you at a book event and say, hey, I, I really like this. Any writer who says that that stuff doesn't matter to them is lying to you. But Bill was really, he, he did appreciate those sorts of things with his readers. And up until he died, when fans would reach out to him, he would always try to, to respond with a personal note. It's always fun, and uh, when people buy my books, it keeps me off the streets. I don't have to go out to the uh, farmer's market in my town and cage quarters from the tourists. Uh, but uh, I, I always uh, enjoy meeting uh, people. So I just have a few more questions left. If you go through his long list of writing, he's got all these short stories and then some of the novels. What are some hidden gems in your in your opinion? Well, so one of them I've got to tell you is a favorite because I am a lifelong Pittsburgh Pirate fan. There's a, a piece that came out uh, in the 80s called Searching for January. And this guy is walking along on a beach uh, while he's on vacation. And this man has four or five days of scruffiness on his face, unshaven. His clothes are all tattered. And he starts to talk with this guy and he realizes it's Roberto Clemente the Pirates right fielder who his plane went down off the coast of Puerto Rico New Year's Eve 1972. And Clemente thinks it's only been five days since his plane went down. And it's very much kind of the same type of theme as Shoeless Joe where, you know, dead ball player comes back to life. But there are some really beautiful quotes in there. Silas Ermine Skin, you know, the, the First Nation stories, I think, are, are really uh, funny. You know, I understand that there are people who take issue with the voice, of, you know, the, the cultural appropriation. Um, I, I don't really subscribe to that. Uh, I think they're, they're fun stories. And I think the, the first one that I mentioned, Ileana Comes Home, is great. There's another one called Brother Frank's, Frank's Gospel Hour, which is really hilarious. And then some of, the, some of the later stories that he would write, some of them are a little bit darker. Um, there's a there's a piece from the 80s called Kmart that is a really just a sad story of, you know, loss. The older you get and realizing that how good you had it as a kid and you're never going to be able to reclaim that again is kind of a sadder story, but is just beautifully written. And so as far as the short stories, those are the ones that, that I like. The novels, I, I there's one that uh, George Clooney apparently had the film rights for for a few years and nothing ever happened. It's called magic time and it's another baseball story set in iowa where the team is a bunch of guys who choke under pressure and they're brought into this town to basically keep the town from drying up and blowing away but they don't know it they're brought there under the guise of this is your chance to latch onto a minor league team and it's a it's a really uh it's a fun story in which he weaves together about half a dozen short stories that he had published before and is able to create a, a narrative with them. And I really like, I, I still wish that they would make a, a film out of that. So it's a, it's a whole team of guys who choke under pressure. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but, and by the time that they realize that's what it is, they've fallen in love with small town life in Iowa. And so they never want to leave. And so the, the kind of the, the city council, so to speak, purposely seeks out these guys. And the guys think that they're coming to play baseball, and they realize when they're just playing for fun and there's no pressure, they're really, really good. But they never play. They always play inter-squad games. And so the protagonist in the, in the book, you know, learns what happens and storms off and, you know, ultimately comes back. But it's, it's, a, it's a really fun piece. Um, and again, one that has more of that kind of upbeat, you know, positive ending that, that Kinsella is known for in his baseball stories. So the last question I have, and you talked about the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Just one more quote from him. He says, if I had my life to live over again, I'd take more chances. I'd want more passion in my life, less fear and more passion, more risk. Even if you fail, you've taken a risk. Now, some people are just restless and perpetually dissatisfied. 
Do you think W.P. Kinsella at the end of his life is that type of person? He's just perpetually restless. At the end of his life, he was happy with what his legacy was going to be. I think he was comfortable with, with where he was at. You know, in fact, one of the last conversations the summer before he died, I, I, I asked him, you know, what do you think your legacy is going to be? And he said, well, you know, I hope that people remember me as being a, a good storyteller and somebody who left them with a smile on their face and a tear in their eye. And so I think as far as that goes, he was, he was happy. You know, I think that there were, looking at some of his private notes and things, I, you know, I think there were some things that he wished would have happened differently. You know, that idea, and I love that quote that you just had, you know, where, you know, if I had it to do over again, I'd take more chances. One of my favorite quotes in Shoeless Joe is when Moonlight Graham says, hardly anybody recognizes the most significant moments of their life while they're happening. You know, you always think there's going to be another day. And, and I love that because it's, it's true, right? It's, it's another one of those cases of fiction speaking truth. And, um, you know, when he says that, you know, you, the most significant moments of your life, you know, one of mine, professionally speaking, was the summer of 1989 when I went to the theater to see that, to see that movie. I had no idea back then as a 16-year-old kid that that was going to shape the trajectory of my of my professional career and that I would be writing the biography of the man who wrote that story. Right. You know, there are things you look back on and say, boy, I wish I would have done that differently. But I think that's the part that Kinsella really taps into because in his baseball fiction, there's always a chance to get a do over. You, you, you may have gone over four with four strikeouts today, but tomorrow you come back and you do it again and maybe you're going to be the hero. And I think that that's the part that, that he's able to tap into with his baseball fiction. It was like having this close to your dreams. And I watched them brush past you like a stranger in a crowd. At the time, you don't think much of it. You know, we just don't recognize the most significant moments of our lives while they're happening. Back then, I thought, well, there'll be other days. I didn't realize that that was the only day. You know, I just did an interview about Tombstone and Wyatt Earp, and his last words were, suppose, suppose. It seems like those could have been W.P. Kinsella's words as well. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when he, you know, he knew he was dying, obviously. And I talked with his best friend, Lee Harwood, and Lee's wife, Maggie, was reading Kinsella's favorite novel, Richard Brodigan's uh, In Watermelon Sugar, reading it to him the night before he passed away. Kinsella, one time he had told a, a I think it was out of Seattle, a newspaper, a magazine that was interviewing him said, what would your, your epitaph be or, you know, your, your kind of legacy? And he said, um, I think I'm going to butcher this quote, but it was, let it be said, his sins were scarlet, but his books were red, R-E-A-D. <laughs> and and I, I included that in the, in the biography because it really, I think that's kind of his tongue in cheek way of saying, you know what? Yeah, I may have been a mess, but people read my stuff. And, and I think that, that he would be okay with that. Well, thanks, Professor Steele. Thank you. What a fascinating character. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. It's been a real pleasure. I would like to thank my guest today, author and researcher, William Steele. And if you're fascinated by W.P. Kinsella's work, just like I am, you can get Professor Steele's book by clicking on the link in the description below. The featured brew was Slingshot Dunkel Dark Lager from the Back Pocket Brewing Company of Coralville, Iowa. And if you find yourself in Iowa City, the old stomping grounds of W.P. Kinsella, make a trip over to Coralville and Back Pocket Brewing. If you liked our talk today, please share the episode with a friend. And remember to subscribe to the podcast. As we mentioned earlier, simply hit the subscribe button on the podcast directory that you use and get new episodes immediately when they are released. Subscribing, as we've said, is the only way to get new shows right away. For additional information on the podcast, like the History of Go-Go Facebook page and check out our YouTube channel as well. The music was provided by the band Bones Fork, and they have a new album which will be released soon. I'll let you know about that. To our growing list of listeners and supporters, as we've said, 50 countries, hundreds of cities across the United States. One more time, I'd like to say thank you. There are many more great episodes on the way with discussions on the history of the 90s sitcom The Office, the General and President Ulysses S. Grant, the Warrior Chief Tecumseh, the Manhattan Project, and the history and impact of, wait for it, the Mosquito. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink 
on History of Go-Go. I never got to bat in the major leagues. I'd have liked to have that chance just once to stare down a big league pitcher. To stare him down and just as he goes into his windup, wink. Make him think you know something he doesn't. That's what I wish. Chance to squint at a sky so blue that it hurts your eyes just to look at it. To feel the tingle in your arm as you connect with the ball. To run the bases, stretch a double into a triple, and flop face first into third. Wrap your arms around the bag. That's my wish, Rick and Sarah. That's my wish. And is there enough magic out there in the moon? Like this week,